And no question about that. But it's not the end of the world. I just want us to do a job that we're capable of doing. They're on their home grounds. This makes it that much more difficult. Understand? If we die, we die together. You can get it done. You can get it done. What's more, you gotta get it done. Now what do we do? We're seven down. I know, Bob, but it's tough. Things got really tough for the Bills as they lost a score when Tony Green's 105-yard interception return was wiped out. But the Bills kept coming, and Washington got another chance to score for the defense. Washington's touchdown brought the Bills close, but with Joe Ferguson injured and trailing 21-14 in the fourth quarter, Buffalo hopes rested squarely on the shoulders of rookie Gary Marangi, who had not played a minute all season. An incredible catch by J.D. Hill made Morangi's first pass as a pro a touchdown pass, as the rookie had brought the Bills into a tie. But soon after, Miami went ahead again, and Morangi faced his second pressure situation. Bobby Chandler said he's wide open in the middle. Matter he will be in We're going to go in the blue, so 53, they try to hit Bobby in the middle. Got the idea? and we let him get off the hook. He had to be pleased with the way Moringa came in. He's still 35-28. That's all I remember. We've got to beat these people one of these days, and we haven't been able to do it. But we're coming after him again next week. But I said, now, Steve, you got to understand if I wear it, you might have a tape full of bleeps. <laughs> he said, no. He said, we'll cut the bleeps out. Guys! Come down in there, Dallas! What the hell's the matter with you guys? Be alert! I tell you, it's going to cost Dedeke, and it's going to cost Dedeke. Dedeke! Uh, Chip Myrtle, Feshy, uh, I love dearly, but I, he used to give me grief like you can't ever believe. Come on, now, Chip Ed! I wanted to get Chip's attention. I said, Chip! 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 Settle down! Play football! My daughter can do better! My daughter can! You're chicken! You're full of chicken manure. <laughs> and I, I, I was astounded by what I had said, you know. <laughs> well, you know, Chip might call me and say, Hey, coach, you're full of chicken. <laughs>
If we get the track, he scores. Another sideline foil was assistant coach Whitey Duvall. And I looked at Whitey. I said, are you sure this guy can play? He says, give him a little more time. Give him a little more time. How much more time are we going to give him? Whitey, I just said to you now, I just said to you, throw on first and ten. And bingo, he goes right over this young kid again. He flattens him. And I looked at Whitey and said, they're killing me, Whitey. They're killing me. And every place I go now, the first thing they say, Lou, they're killing me, Whitey. That's an opening statement. I'd like to see him die out there. Let him go. And it just tore me up because I wasn't a part of that action. I was the guy on the sideline, and I couldn't do anything but direct traffic, so to speak. Lou Saban wasn't the winningest coach we ever wired, but in one area, he was by far the best. He led the league in classic quotes. You can get it done. You can get it done. What's more, you gotta get it done. Yeah. The, the greatest hits of Lou Saban would be like... <laughs> In the early 1960s, and again in the 1970s, the Buffalo Bills enjoyed two separate glory eras. The driving force behind each was Lou Saban, a dedicated, hard-working coach who endeared himself to his players by the way he treated them. A former all-star linebacker with the Cleveland Browns, Lou came to Buffalo as a head coach for the first time in 1962. Trader Lou set to work rebuilding the Bills. And in 62 and 63, they improved to 7, 6, and 1. In 64 and 65, the Bills went 12 and 2 and 10, 3 and 1 en route to consecutive AFL championships. Saban was named Coach of the Year twice, but one week after winning his second title, he quit to become head coach at Maryland. Saban did not return to Buffalo until 1971, and during his absence, the Bills lost 60 games. In 1972, Saban inherited a 1 and 13 team. During his second stint, Saban created The Electric Company. Joe Delamalure, Donnie Green, Dave Foley, Reggie McKenzie, and Mike Montler. The Bills improved to 4 and 9 in 72, and in 1973, the Bills soared to 9 and 5, and O.J. Simpson became the first pro back to rush for more than 2,000 yards in a season. Recalls Booker Edgerson, he respected us and treated us as individuals. And he taught us to respect each other as human beings. The players loved him. And despite our differences, we came together and played as a team. What greater tribute can a coach ask from his players? Lou Saban, forever enshrined in the Greater Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame. Hired the 29-year-old Saban as its coach in 1950. Five years later, he was at Northwestern, heading a staff that included a graduate assistant named George Steinbrenner. It was a great experience because you learned under Lou a discipline. That was very important. You learned under Lou a loyalty. Those two qualities are forever in my mind. The Boston Patriots chose Saban as their first coach in 1960. Two years later, he went to Buffalo where he acquired players like quarterback Jack Kemp, number 15, and turned the last place Bills into two-time champions of the American Football League. I played for Buddy Parker, Sid Gilman, for Vince Lombardi. But Lou Saban uh, stands out among giants, he stands out. He was the dominant football coach in the American Football League in the middle 60s. Play football and have some fun, not the out of people. He would get mad at certain players. I tell you, it's going to cost Dennecke, and it's going to cost Dennecke, Freddie. Dennecke! He knew which people to um, pat on the back and to talk in a calm voice. Wandy, just don't let them, don't let them dominate you. Got the idea? That's what worries me all the time about you. A lot of these guys that push you around, I don't want that to happen. You've got to be strong. He was a uh, person that could get... Um, as much as you had to give and a little more. I just said to him, guys, I'm going to say things you may not like. What the hell's the matter with you guys? But just remember, I'm saying it because I think it's at that moment I was going to make you better than what you are. My daughter should do better! My daughter should do better! They're killing me, Whitey! They're killing me! Lou Saban made me a football player. 
He singled me out, telling me that I was either going to be a hitter rather than a pusher, or if I didn't learn to play the game quickly, that um, he was going to replace me. I'm in the Pro Football Hall of Fame because of him. Of all the athletes and people I've coached with and been involved with, he was the ultimate warrior. You'd want him as a player, you'd want him as your captain, you'd want him as your coach. That's the best you can say about a man, I think. I think what motivates Lou is his love for the game and the charge that he gets out of watching people improve. There comes a time when you uh, gain the respect of the people you play against and the people within the league. So just remember one thing, that you are on your way to be a winner. That's probably what keeps him going. I can't imagine Lou Saban doing anything else but coaching. I never met anybody who loved young men and football more than Coach Saban. Remember, you're young people, and uh, experiences are great. Life is great. You gotta make it, put it to good use. Don't waste your time, because time, as I've said a million times, is your worst enemy. You never know how much of that you have. You don't look back. You look as up, as I said, look for today. What happened today and what did you do? And how exciting was it? I can't ask for a more exciting day. <laughs> My dad said to me, son, he said, uh, fans and people will remember the moment or the day. But then again, time marches on. Keep looking ahead. And uh, that's pretty much the way I've looked at it all my life.